e-liquids, with vaping, we are the trial generation, the worldwide guinea pigs. Just remember that next time you try a brand new flavor, because that's all it took for me. Just a new flavor, a new batch. You want to talk about disgusting side effects from this shit? Have you ever heard of fecal vomiting? Being so messed up internally that you stop puking up literal shit? Yeah? I had it happen to me. I had no idea I was standing on a precipice that would forever mark my healthy life before and my awful new life after inhaling that noxious e-liquid. So hello you wonderful citizen of YouTube, welcome back to the disastrous tales of my largely disastrous life on this incredibly sweltering day where my computer is chuntering very loudly and my hair is doing completely whack shit and we're just going to pretend that none of that is going on. If you've been listening to these stories for a while, you'll know I've made a lot of stupid reckless decisions when it comes to my health. But you know what wrecked it forever? The thing that put me on disability for years on end, where I would still be if it wasn't for this and you. It was, of all things, vaping. No shit. And it didn't take me 20 years to end up a wreck. It took me one day. One day and my body would never ever be the same again. It's a story I've wanted to tell for a long, long time and a lot of people have asked about over the years. But I also knew, back when it happened, it was a story no one would want to hear, even less to believe, because vaping was all the rage. It was healthier than smoking. It's just water vapor, people would say. <laughs> people who should never, ever be allowed to possess a chemistry set, clearly. Like, I've not heard this quote in a while, but back in 2013 when this happened, literally, vapors were always saying, it's just... It's so not water vapor. I know exactly what goes in e-liquid and it's, it's <coughs> sorry, but no, it's not just water vapor. Anyway, now it's 2023. Australia are about to ban recreational vaping. I'm not sure what other kind of vaping there is, like professional vaping. I, I don't know, but Australia are about to ban it. There are teens popping up on TikTok with collapsed lungs from puffing on endless elf bars and we're starting to realise vaping is not this perfect godsend. And in my case, in my case, I reckon I'd be so much better off if I just stuck to fucking smoking. Even when it comes to vaping, if I'd just known a few things that I know now, I could have kept myself so much safer. And I'll be telling you about those things in this video if you're a vapor, like certain things are very, very easy to avoid. And hopefully you will end up not in my position. Um, so here we go with the whole cataclysmic tale. Before I vaped, I was a weed and tobacco smoker. That is both things rolled together in a joint because that's the European way. We're disgusting. We put tobacco in our joints. Um, by the time I'd been writing for a year in 2012, I was smoking around 21 unfiltered kingskins a day, which is profoundly disgusting. But here's the thing. I didn't have any physical health issues, but my weed and tobacco habit was getting a bit gruesome. Once or twice, I woke up in the night having to sit bolt upright and cough up the tar that was fully blocking my airway. And honestly, it's a miracle I didn't just suffocate in my sleep on all this like tarry crap that was in my lungs from smoking. Considering all this overlapped with heavy heroin and methadone use, I could have just suffocated on it and I didn't because there we go, I am cockroach boy, nothing kills me. So after getting really sick of the constant tarry feeling in my lungs and throat, I decided to give vaping a go. At first it seemed pretty goddamn miraculous. It tastes better than tobacco, the stink is downgraded, and you get a shiny purple or rainbow coloured vape instead of your endless roaches and overflowing ashtrays that you're constantly putting your elbow in and knocking all over the carpet. Overall, it just seemed cleaner, more futuristic, less totally grim than smoking. Until, that is, I tried a new brand of e-liquid. This is where the one day part of the equation kicks in. I vaped in total for two or three months, I think, but it was one day of vaping that new brand that did me in forever. Now, the company I bought this profoundly dodgy substance from are well known for being litigious. That is to say, they will sue the fuck out of anyone who speaks against them. 
And that makes me a little curious as to how many other people have gone through or may be going through the same shit I did and do to this day. There was evidence online that they frequently sue their detractors, but I could not find out what those detractors had been saying. Did they suffer lifelong health issues too? I guess I'll never know. But to hopefully dance around their litigious stance, all I can say is that the company was UK-based, they had a little devil logo, and their name sounded a tiny bit like focally tricked. And that's about as close as I dare go without risking a lawsuit, hopefully. They were and still are one of the biggest e-liquid companies on these shores. To make this a fully honest, fully balanced, fully true story, I will say I vaped their liquids without issue for around two months until I tried their Patriot range because they had like a few different ranges under the umbrella of their company, the Patriot range. Ironic, its name, Patriot Range, as in Americana, as in freedom, and yet the number of freedoms lost to me forever after that day due to my health are too numerous and depressing to even count. So the Patriot Range, it was a screamingly all-American selection of eye-poppingly strong candy flavours, not that I knew it yet. I just knew that my autistic tendency to get really into a new special interest, which vaping so was for me back then combined with my ADHD sensation-seeking, meant that I wanted to sample every single e-liquid flavour on Earth. And why the hell not? It was like an almighty binge buffet of calorie-free flavoured air. It was every eating disordered person's wildest dream, wasn't it? All those dessert flavours filled with nicotine to get you through the day and mute your appetite. It was a brilliant discovery, right? Like vaping, you know, it's safe and it's clean and it tastes so delicious and you can do it all day. It doesn't go out like a cigarette. You can vape all day and it's lovely and there's nothing that's going to go wrong. Well, just wait and see how that fucking went in eating disorder terms. We're in October now, 2013. I just started back at university for my third and final year, and I ordered three flavours from Focally Trickard's Patriot range. I still remember everything, every detail, from the names of the flavours to the eeriness of the dead black cat I had to step around on my walk into uni that morning. Was that black cat a warning, a curse, or just a cat? Who knows, but it was weird timing in retrospect. If you see a dead black cat in your path, maybe it's a good day to be fucking careful. Anyway, like I said, I remember it all. Wouldn't you, after having your whole life chomped in half in a single day? The flavours I bought were orange candy, holiday spice and Patty's Wicked Peppermint Cream. And the difference in what I'd bought compared to the e-liquids I'd had from them or from anyone before, it was visually fucking apparent straight out of the mail because these e-liquids were neon. Thick with colourings, bright orange, deep red and dog shit brown respectively. I'd never seen anything like it. Why in hell's name would you put colourings in something you're planning to inhale? Look at the components of e-liquid. You want the nicotine, because you're an addict. You want the PG for the throat hit, the VG for the clouds, and the flavourings to make it nice. But what purpose does a colouring serve? When it comes to safety, I've no doubt these were food colourings that people had been eating without issue for years. But there is a vast difference between eating something and inhaling its heated vapours. Do you remember my story about the stupidest thing I ever injected? How the thing that came so close to killing me wasn't, you know, heroin or crack or cocaine or any of these things that, you know, we hear about and, oh, that's a terrible thing to inject. No, the thing that nearly killed me was an over-the-counter cold medication, which, you know, most people don't shoot up because they're not mad. Um, but this is the thing. If you take that medication orally, you'll barely realise it has stimulant properties at all and it certainly isn't particularly dangerous. But if you shoot it up, it becomes a terrifying stimulant death trip. The bioavailability and potential danger of any given compound is completely different depending how it's being ingested. So again, I ask you, why would you put colourings in something you intend to vaporise and inhale? 
And bear in mind, I ask you this as someone who has personally cooked up blood clots and injected the result. Chunky, hello. I ask you this as someone who has picked up drug filters they've squashed repeatedly with their socks into the carpet and still considered imbibing the contents. I am not a careful nor even sane person when it comes to the shit I have put inside my body over the years. So what the fuck were folkly tricked thinking with this shit if even I am like, why are you doing this? If you're still vaping coloured e-liquid right now, please, God, don't. Do not. I think it was, by and large, a brief trend that happily went away, this thing for coloured e-liquids. And I wonder why it went away. How many people did this happen to? I don't know. But I can wholeheartedly say it's a ticking time bomb, these vastly unnecessary chemicals that have never been vaporised and inhaled and tested for safety until the last decade. You know, it's just like with smoking. When smoking started, people didn't know there was anything wrong with it. They put filters in the cigarettes and everyone went, oh, it's safe now. That's kind of how it is with e-liquids and us now. You know, we, we are the guinea pig generation. Thing is, I didn't know all that about colourings back then, did I? I totally trusted Vocally Tricket. They'd never steered me wrong so far. This being such, I tried each of the three flavours. You know, the final kicker. They were all completely disgusting. It wasn't even worth it. Like, they were ludicrously over-flavoured, so intense it made you grimace, just vile, vile shit. And it may even have been one single drag on Patty's Wicked Peppermint that did me in be that due to the thick brown food colourings or the disgusting quantity of artificial flavourings, I immediately felt dizzy, surreal, disoriented. I'd never felt anything like that from an e-liquid before. But it was the orange candy that I actually vaped for half an hour, having watered it down to a palatable mix with my usual colouring-free strawberry e-juice. After this half hour, though, I started experiencing symptoms I'd never had from e-liquid before. They started out pretty mild, just hiccups and a nasty burning feeling in my throat that turned into a pretty horrible case of heartburn. Not pleasant, but not deathly either. Not yet. I didn't think much of it, just switched back to vaping my old stuff, deciding these new flavours were a total bust. Nothing to worry about, obviously, it's just e-liquid, it's just water vapour! But 40 minutes later, my heart rate shot through the roof, leaping up to about 160 beats per minute, combined with this crippling anxiety that definitely wasn't provoked by my surroundings. I was just chilling in my room, nothing was going on, and I certainly didn't suspect the e-liquid of any great evil. Why would I? It was a vile feeling. Like the after effects of injecting dodgy cocaine or smoking crack, this unpleasantly tweaked out, heart racing, nerves tight as piano wires, body in full on adrenaline dump mode sort of thing. Like it genuinely felt like I'd taken some kind of really horrible drug. But I wasn't particularly worried because like I said, I used to treat my body like a garbage can and it always bounced back. And this was just e-liquid. What was there to worry about? I had no idea I was standing on a precipice that would forever mark my healthy life before and my awful new life after inhaling that noxious fucking e-liquid. When the reaction refused to die down for the next hour, I went to Focally Trickid's website where they used to have a forum. They've since deleted it. Wonder why. What was going on there? What was being said? Amidst all the happy chatter about types of vape, flavour reviews, vape juice mixing recipes, what was being said there that was so potentially damaging it needed scrubbing in its entirety from the web? Like, that forum had been there a long time. Like, you know, in internet terms, it was pretty well established. Went to look it up before I made this video, thinking, look, can I still find this post? Can I still find this as, like, a timestamp of what was going on? whole forum has vanished. All their website was still there, looked the way it did before, but the forum whoosh, vanished. Weird. Anyway, back then, I left a post there citing the e-liquids I'd used, the symptoms I was experiencing, and wondering whether anyone else had ever had the same thing. I would never manage to check back on this post. Things got real way, way too fast. I only mention it, like say, because it would be an evidential timestamp on all of this if they hadn't mysteriously scrubbed that evidence from the web along with every other post on the forum. Hmm. 
hmm. But I still wasn't worried. Like I said, I'd done plenty of dumb things in my time and thus had suffered plenty of unpleasant evenings as a result of imbibing bad chemicals. Surely this was just the same sort of shit. It was weird, coming from a fully legal, technically safe e-liquid. But nonetheless, it'd be over in a few hours or by morning, right? This isn't the end of your life as you fucking know it. I had no clue. None. But the symptoms went on and on and on. It was, I believe, three or four days of my heart rate going even faster, up to 170 to 200 beats per minute now, for those three or four straight days that I started to get a little bit concerned. My hands were going tingly and numb by turn. My vision was blurred. My heart felt like a sodden old sponge being thwacked with a baseball bat. My mouth was dry as a desert. My eyeballs felt shriveled in their sockets from lack of sleep. And all in all, I was starting to wonder with the racing heart and the numb hands and all the rest of it, how far away from a heart attack I might actually be. I'd also noticed at this point that vaping my usual e-liquid suddenly seemed to make my heart race even faster. So I went old school and smoked half a roll up. This, despite having been something I'd done for years, turned out to be a terrible flipping idea. And I had no idea why back then. My heart rate shot through the roof, all the heart attacky symptoms got even worse, and round about 11pm I got my parents to take me to hospital, which was fun, by the way. Naturally, knowing me, they were convinced I'd taken something stupid, and realistically, I had. Like say, inhaling vaporised colourings is fucking stupid, but everything came from a reputable manufacturer, right? Everything was legal. My parents totally didn't buy that. At the hospital, they did an ECG, confirmed that my heart was indeed going double or more the speed it ought to be, but said it didn't appear to be about to explode or anything. So after a nice nurse theorised that it was probably a dodgy batch of e-liquid with too much nicotine in it and it would eventually wear off, I had a really frustrating run-in with this doctor who spoke so little English it was impossible to even explain my predicament. I kept trying to tell him what e-liquid was, he wasn't grasping it, and I just could not deal with the whole fucking nightmare. So I gave up on that doctor, went home, and waited for my GP surgery to open in the morning. They immediately prescribed me beta blockers to slow my heart down, which worked for a sum total of three hours. After three hours of being literally knocked out on my ass, able to do nothing besides sleep, now my body was finally calm again, after three hours of that, it all came rushing back. These beta blockers were ones you were supposed to take once a day. This was supposed to last like all day. It lasted three hours and then psh, the, the horrible stuff was back. The racing heart, the blurred vision, the numb hands and the insomnia and the horrible speedy tweaked out anxiety feeling over and over and over again for days. Days that rolled into weeks, into months. The doctors I saw were initially convinced it was just anxiety, the way they always are when you've got anxiety on your notes and you come in with something physical. I'd come in shaking like a crackhead, heart rate of 190, and I'd have to sit there and calmly converse with them for several minutes, all while they held their fingers to my pulse and observed that my calm demeanour was completely out of sync with what my body was doing. It clearly wasn't a panic attack. My nervous system was just in total perpetual overdrive. Like, they would talk to me, and they because they would assume, like, okay, you've got to be freaking out. For your heart to be going this fast, and you've got anxiety on your notes, you've got to be freaking out, so we'll talk to you and feel your pulse, and it will slow down when you sit down and talk to us. And it did not. It didn't matter how calm I was and how much I was talking to them. They could still feel my heart going do, 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 all the time and the shaking and all of that. So they ruled out hypothyroidism and at that point they didn't really know what they were doing. So the beta blockers became a repeat prescription and they threw diazepam into the mix to make things more tolerable between those three hour beta blocker windows of peace. But aside from that, there seemed to be nothing they could do besides advise me to stay away from all e-liquid and anything else that triggered these effects that would turn out to be easier said than done. Because this numb hands, blurred vision, heart attack in progress, no sleep ever shit persisted and persisted until I was on the verge of suicide. I was rapidly learning that the only way to drop back down from this hyperadrenalized state, my entire nervous system in overdrive, was to avoid anything that even half constituted a stimulant. Nicotine and caffeine being the most obvious culprits, 
But along with that, I was now reacting to many, many, many artificial ingredients. Colorings in food now fucked me up. Ditto many flavorings, ditto sweeteners, which tend to make up 40% of an eating disordered person's diet. Xanthan gum, whatever the hell that is, was another disaster. And unfortunately, that shit is in everything, from yogurts to candy to just about every store-bought sourcing condiment. There was also the very large problem that colorings aren't just in food. They're in medication. For the rest of my life, I will have to avoid certain coloured medications. There are some colourings I found. Actually, this doesn't fuck me up, but quite a lot of them do. And it would also turn out further down the road that I now reacted horribly to lidocaine, meaning that if I ever need fillings or even a few stitches, I have no idea what they will do about that. The knock-on effects were and are terrifying. And if I had a reaction, it wasn't just a few hour blip. Like, oh, I shouldn't eat this. This fucks me up. It'd be all right in the morning. Every single reaction I had lasted three days and nights. Every tiny slip up or error in my diet meant 72 hours in tweaked out palpitation hell. And all of these hypersensitivities were new to me. I didn't know what ingredients to avoid except through endless trial and error. I'd barely managed to emerge from one nightmare, then I'd eat or drink something else, and boom, slice the next three days out your calendar, boys. We're going to be shaking and sweating and freaking out instead of going to uni or that party or that club night. My entire life was fucked. And just like anyone who comes down with a weird or invisible condition, half the people in your life are convinced you're going mad just for an extra sprinkling of fun on your newly wrecked life. But because I'd already had an eating disorder... Most of my family were convinced I was making this up to avoid calories, being like, oh, no, can't eat that, it's going to make me ill. Like, they were like, this is an eating disordered thing. Except the stupid thing was, it was all my safe foods that I could no longer eat. The low-calorie versions of stuff are packed with chemicals that now made me sick, sweeteners, flavourings, all that crap. I had to up my calories to stay even half healthy. And that just isn't ED thinking, a fact my family seemed wholly unable to grasp. I had to quit smoking, vaping, everything nicotine related, 100% cold turkey, which was just shit. Walking around sucking on knitting needles all day because there were no substitutes I could use. It was the nicotine I was both addicted to and now allergic to. Quitting like that, it was an experience that's left me, I'm afraid, with very little sympathy for people who say they can't quit smoking or vaping or that it's as hard as kicking heroin. It genuinely fucking isn't. It isn't. Not even cold turkey. And you guys can use nicotine gum or patches or anything you like as a methadone type stand in. And ultimately, if you can't quit, it's not an instant death decision for you, is it? I didn't even want to quit. That was the worst thing. I didn't even want to. I had no desire to. It was purely forced on me. And ugh, it was bloody miserable. I also came very close to having to drop out of uni in my final year due to the ongoing reactions. I missed, I don't even know how many weeks. I do not know how many weeks I missed and how much I had to catch up with. And for a while it was like, yeah, it would be better to just drop out, really. Um, I managed to get through it, but my ultimate grade was not great. And my social life was trashed by the fact I could no longer be around cigarette or vape smoke, which tended to provoke the worst reactions of all, combining all the usual speedy heart attack hell with a whole lot of vomiting. And frankly, like I said, I was pretty close to ending my own life because 80% of my time now seemed to be spent in the hellish depths of a reaction that no one understood. And as autumn faded into the depths of winter, it was grimly apparent that this shit was not going away. Are you waiting for some kind of story now? Some kind of... and then? <laughs> Tough shit, there isn't one. You don't get that luxury with chronic illness. It barges into your life, pile drives the spleen out of you, and it never ever pisses off. This is my life now. I wrote a song about it circa 2014, and I'm just popping in here to let you know that I have stuck this song on the end of the video because I went back and listened to it, and I was like, oh, I really like this song, actually. It's a miserable little thing, but I like it because it really just shows how I felt about all of this when it first kicked off. It was like a year after it started that I wrote this song. I was looking around at other YouTubers and people of my own age group and seeing what their lives were compared to like what I had left in my life, the, the things I had lost, traveling particularly, 
And yes, this song about being a little ghost of the internet who only exists behind a screen because I can't really go anywhere or do anything and I just exist in here and there's people asking you, when am I going to see you here? When am I going to see you there? You're never going to see me anywhere. Um, I'm a ghost of the cyberverse. That was kind of what the song was about. So I've stuck it on the end of this video. So uh, anyway, with that said, back to my waffle. Bye bye. I was on YouTube by then and people asked if they'd ever see me at festivals or meet and greets. And it was just gutting because I couldn't do any of that shit. There was too much cigarette and vape smoke at outdoor festivals. And as for a meet and greet, I was too consistently ill to be reliable ever. I barely dared book a night out with a single friend lest I be forced to let them down again and again and again and that has been the death of so many friendships because it's like how do you even dare book to do something with a friend when you know you're probably going to have to let them down five times before you actually get there. It's just fucking embarrassing and it's ultimately when you've done this time and time again you just think look I'm just not going to book anything with anyone so you don't see them and people think you don't like them anymore and it's like no but I can't see you and even the people who know you still like them. People's patience only stretches so far with this shit, you know? I certainly couldn't book any sort of date with numerous people, so out went the possibility of any kind of meet and greet type thing, along with the possibility of ever being in a band, a notion I'd been flirting with for a couple of years at that point. Just another dead dream now. I'll be here, inside this screen, just watching you play living vicariously through other YouTubers, YouTubers with healthy bodies and actual lives, bands and friendships that haven't withered away and died. You notice that, you know, most people on YouTube, they, they seem to go out and do things. They, they seem to have lives. I don't have a fucking life anymore. No, none of that shit. Not ever again. So I guess the big question is, what happened, medically speaking? The technical term has changed multiple times over the decade I've been sick with this, these days, they mostly call it tilt, toxicant, induced loss of tolerance. If you want to be brutal about it, it's basically Gulf War Syndrome, the civilian version. What happened was that my body was hit by such a massive toxic blast in that goddamn e-liquid, it became hyper alert to every chemical going. Every totally safe minor chemical I ingest, my body flips out about like it's dying and it always will. I've seen a girl on TikTok recently talking about the fact that she now has this from gel nails. She used to do a lot of gel nail polish at home and she's ended up with a version of this where it's, I think, acrylates, like the, the chemicals that are in gel nail polish that she now reacts to in the same horrible way. And for her, it's bloody awful because acrylates are in so many medical things. Like she will never be able to get a filling because the glue they use to stick your filling in with, she reacts to. She also can't get dentures because they're made of that too. Um, if she ever needs a hip replacement, can't have that because the things they use in hip replacements, acrylates she reacts to. So, and since hearing that, I'm like, because mm, I don't react to gel nails at the moment, but like, I don't, I don't want that. So you can, you can get this from a lot of different things. If you overload your body with any specific type of chemical, you tend to react to that chemical and anything that's somehow chemically related to it. It's pretty shit. Frankly, as miserable as it is, I don't even have it that bad compared to some people whose reactions are triggered by anyone around them wearing a single scented product or people who can't walk down the detergent aisle at the supermarket without keeling over. Like I said, it kind of depends what chemical ultimately poisoned you as to the kind of things you react to and how severe it gets and all of that. Like, there's so many different variations and I'm fairly lucky with mine in that most of the reactions I have are confined to the things I eat and drink with the miserable exception of cigarette and vape smoke, something that means I haven't been to a single house party in 10 years because that's another one. There's always someone smoking or vaping at a house party so I can't go. Toxicant induced loss of tolerance most commonly happens to people who've lived near a gas leak or chemical spill or who've been exposed to toxic black mold for months on end. In my case, all it took was half an hour of vaping Focally Trickid's Patriot range. And doesn't that say it all regarding the toxicity of that e-liquid? Was it a nicotine overdose, a dodgy batch? Or was it, as I suspect, simply the noxious combination of vaporised food colourings and a hugely overdone dose of flavourings, all vaped and inhaled as nature never intended. I don't know. To take full fucking accountability here, though, 
obviously there were probably other factors, reasons that I got hit like this when we didn't hear about a mass outbreak. Like, I don't think everyone who vaped the Patriot range this happened to, and there's probably reasons for that. Some of those factors, in my case, revolve around the fact that I'd used my body as a chemical disposal plant for years on end, shooting up coke, shooting up speed and oxy and smack and morphine and several other bad idea chemicals. My body was, I suspect, moving towards the extent of its chemical tolerance. And in my case, all the drugs followed by that noxious e-liquid made the perfect storm. But I'm hardly a unique case, am I? You rarely meet an ex-addict who doesn't or hasn't at some point been a smoker or vapor. So if you're an ex-addict and you vape, or you're even just a long-term smoker or vapor who vapes, how many more chemicals are left on your bingo sheet before your body stands up and screams enough? With e-liquids, with vaping, we are the trial generation, the worldwide guinea pigs. Just remember that next time you try a brand new flavor that's all it took for me. Just a new flavour, a new batch. Being the first to try a new e-liquid is just as dumb as saying yes when your smack dealer's got a new batch in and want some self-destructive twat to try it for free. Nothing is free. The cost is your health or your life. Saying no to drugs is not something I was historically capable of, but I will always say no to going first now. Maybe that's selfish, maybe it's just the only sane thing to do. So, whatever. Now it's a full decade later and this shit is still my life. It's a little better than it was since I went on beta blockers full time for three years, but that was a soul-destroying move. I was groggy and slow the whole time for three years. I gained 50 fucking pounds. So a real happy ending there for the, wow, look at all these magical calorie-free dessert flavors. Vaping's the route to eternal thinness. Bullshit I used to believe with my eating disorder and vaping. I gained 50 fucking pounds after those pills wrecked my metabolism permanently. And the beta blockers also gave me a mysterious tolerance to opioids that meant methadone stopped killing my cravings, and that led me to becoming a near-death level alcoholic. Like, I'm not even fucking around here. You want to talk about disgusting side effects from this shit? Have you ever heard of fecal vomiting? Being so messed up internally that you stop puking up literal shit? Yeah? Well, most people who experience that die within a few weeks unless surgically intervened on. I had it happen to me. I was too sick to face going to hospital, but for some godforsaken reason, I'm still fucking alive. And it all, quite frankly, leads back to focally triggered and their filthy e-liquid. Obviously, this is a few years down the line. A few different decisions had been made, but it all dated back to that. Great poster child campaign that'd make. Elf bars. They make the taste of your own vomited feces a little sweeter. Mm-mm. No. Hard pass. Remember that. The idea of vomit and shit commingled in your mouth next time you vape. Maybe that'll get you to trash that vile chemical reeking fog machine. But anyway, returning to the beta blockers, after wrecking my entire body and metabolism, they did dole down the reactions quite a bit. I can actually eat a semi-reasonable range of foods now, though the reactions are always multiplying and getting weirder, which is kind of the way it goes with these things. You know, the, the more you react to stuff, the more reactions you end up with. Your body's always kind of on guard against more chemicals and it, ugh, it's just ridiculous. These days, if I put lime in my water, I won't be able to sleep for two days and I have no idea why. Like, what the hell is so terrible about lime's body? And like I said, not being able to go near cigarette smoke has murdered my friendships. I can go to clubs, thank God for the smoking ban, which is ironic as fuck, given I was still a smoker when it came in in 06. And it made me so furious that like, you couldn't still smoke in clubs anymore. You had to go outside. I hated that shit. But now it's the only reason I can go anywhere. <sighs> Trouble is, clubs are where you make acquaintances. House parties are where you solidify your friendships. And I can't go. There's always some noxious smoker or vapor belching out industrial waste somewhere. So that's that. I have barely any friends left. And the reactions are still too fucked up for me to ever work a standard nine to five job again. So why didn't I sue? There's a couple of reasons and they both suck. 
Firstly, because I had an absolute dick of a drug worker who didn't believe in autism. Like, that shouldn't have been a big enough red flag not to listen to the guy. He was a classist, ableist piece of shit, but he fully convinced me that I would never be listened to or believed, so not to even bother trying. Like, say, this was back in the era when, like, oh, vaping's so safe, it's just water vapor, and here's me going, like, this has ruined my entire life, like, I'm allergic to everything now, it was such a weird thing, like... He was just like, no, it's, it's bullshit. No one's going to listen to you. No one's going to believe you. So I didn't even bother trying, which is stupid. There are so many no win, no fee lawyers out there. You should always ask. Like, just ask a fucking lawyer who knows about these things. Don't listen to some unqualified plonker with a great big mouth. Ask a fucking lawyer. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. But he got so in my head, I didn't even ask. And then, me being stupid, there's also the soul-destroying fact I'd long since thrown out the e-liquids I reacted to, because I thought it was just a temporary bad reaction, and therefore I didn't want to get them mixed up with my normal shit. I thought, oh, I'll still be able to vape, like, no, life will go on, I just don't want to, like, accidentally have this happen again, so I threw them out. They were clearly toxic. I didn't want them in my possession, but how stupid is that? They were vital evidence, and I just tossed them in the bin, thinking it would all miraculously go away. I didn't know those e-liquids were a permanent downward spiral in my life and something I should keep in order to seek compensation. You fucking dumbass. Anyway, now it's been a full decade, I highly doubt there's anything doing, legally speaking. So, to my unqualified prat of a drug worker, I say fuck you, Carl. Fuck you, quite possibly, to the tune of tens of thousands of pounds. I will never know. But that's the story. That's my health clusterfuck and it's going nowhere. Anyone who has an inkling of the brand I might be talking about, do they still put colourings in their Patriot range or have they learned better by now? And if they learned, how? How many people had to go through this shit before they worked out what they were doing? They clearly don't have a reputation for litigiousness for nothing. Who or what issue did they have to repeatedly sue into silence? No smoke without fire, I reckon, but obviously I have to say that's just an allegation and a wild theory. I can, however, say fuck you, you fucking bastards, you stole my entire life. Except that's not really true, is it? Truth is, I was approaching the end of university and staring down a pretty grim future. Even with flawless physical health back then, I was still too goddamn autistic to work the average 9-to-5 gig, so honestly the career I was looking into was stacking shelves at night for Tesco or similar, something with minimal human interaction, zero responsibility on a nocturnal schedule. But instead, I got shafted by Focally Trickered, and in the ensuing social desert of boredom, sickness, and isolation, I started fucking about with a webcam, tossed myself into an online debate about the goth scene, and accidentally created this YouTube channel. Never intended it to be a thing, never really even knew it could be a thing that pays the bills. Honestly, half the people in my life are still clueless that it does. Everyone just thinks you've got this really bizarre, narcissistic non-job of a hobby, which is fair enough, it's a weird one. But I like it most of the time, doing this. Don't enjoy the attention, do not like being Googleable. fucking hate the online drama that's an unfortunate periodic side effect of all this, but overall, overall I reckon it beats stacking shelves at Tesco as far as job satisfaction and creative output goes. And now, now there are actually people reading my books, which really was the one and only thing that made me decide to stick at this weird job whenever things got or get iffy. Some sort of platform for the books to jump off. I never intended to tell anyone my life story like some bloated old windbag, but here we are, <laughs> that's what we're doing. And for some weird and wonderful reason, you're still here watching or reading it. So, did Focally Tricked fuck me or make me? Debatable, I guess. And uh, that's the, the end of this uh, waffle slash rant. Um, <laughs> so now you know, this is, this is the health issue that, that I am repeatedly, constantly bitching about to some degree. This is why if you ever see me with, with shaky hands in the video, actually, look at that, look at that, look at that. Not, oh, this one's a bit wobbly, but 
see if I put it if I put it in that angle oh a bit wobbly but this one look at that this one could be a surgeon bit weird usually it's both but um yeah if you see me with the shaky hands usually it is it is yeah something that I've eaten and oftentimes I don't even know what it is that I've eaten I've just spent the last two days not really sleeping because I had a donut in the morning I have no idea what was wrong with that donut it just looked like a fucking normal chocolate donut two days without sleeping felt so shit yesterday um don't know what was in that donut but I guess I'm not eating chocolate donuts for a while um because yeah the the reactions that the Ugh, they are they are a lot better like say since the three years I spent feeling like a groggy snail on beta blockers that seems to have died down a lot of stuff but it's also changed so much about my body it, you know it fucked my metabolism permanently like I just you know my body's weight set point is completely different to how it had been all my life like all my life I was born underweight I was underweight until I was like 32 and I went on the beta blockers and now it's like no, that's 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 not my body anymore. And it happened, you know, obviously people will say, oh, you know, when you get older, things do these things. But it was so sudden with the beta blockers. And, I, you know, I think age-related weight gain tends to creep onto most people, not just like, boom, beta blockers, 50 pounds. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it did that. And it fucked up my tolerance to certain chemicals as well, like, or drugs rather. Like, my tolerance is, is just way different to how it used to be. And it's, so many things anyway this is this is a boring waffle if anyone else has any um weird stories about reactions or illnesses or whatever that have been caused by vaping or e-liquid i would be really intrigued to know if anything sinister has ever happened to any of you guys it sucks because i do still like i have a real love hate relationship with with like the idea of vaping now I can't go anywhere near anyone who's vaping. The, the puking that it tends to cause smoke and vape smoke is really unpleasant. But at the same time, I am jealous. I am still jealous of people who can vape. I did for a while find that I could vape pure vegetable glycerine. So no nicotine, no flavorings, no PG. There was like no throat hit. It was just literally vegetable glycerine. So it made big smoke clouds but did nothing else. And I, I went back to vaping that for a while because it was still like, I still really missed it when I was reading and stuff. I was like, oh, I just want something to smoke or vape or whatever. So I found with a lot of horrible trial and error and a lot of getting sick, I finally found, oh, pure VG, I can vape. Um, but eventually my vape broke. And at that point I was like, look, take this as a sign. Stop doing it. Um, you're hearing more and more and more about how bad this is for your lungs. And my lungs at the moment are about the one part of me that actually works fine weirdly, considering where all this came from. I don't have any issues with my lungs. So I was like, look, the vape's broken. Let's just not, let's not do this anymore. But uh, anyway, this is this is a huge waffle. If you want more disastrous stories of my disastrous life, the, uh, the playlist and all of that is below. Or you can go and check it out on Patreon if you don't want annoying adverts getting in your way and all of that stuff. Thank you for listening. Okay, I'm going away now. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Living life isn't